thing I'd like to ask is how many of you have been up to the mansion Glen Sheen and taken the tour? Okay, quite a few. Well, that's, that's good. It's a great tour and I, and I really, really love going up there. When you took the tour, did they tell you everything you wanted to know about the murders? <laughs> many no's on that and for, for quite a few years they would say nothing about it. These days they're a little more open and sometimes will tell you which room it was where Ms. Congdon was killed. But they're still pretty tight-lipped about what happened uh, the, the, the night of June 27, 1977. And as Kathleen mentioned, um, I was a rookie reporter. I had just been hired by the Star Tribune. We were the Tribune in those days. I was the morning paper. Many of you remember we used to actually have two separate papers. And I had been hired to just do feature stories for the Sunday paper. It wasn't really much news kinds of things, but I did things like how to fix up your basement and build, how to build bookcases and stories like that. But I was really happy to be working at the big paper. Well, one Monday morning in June of 1977, I was headed up towards Duluth to write a story about strawberry farmers in Askov. That was going to be my feature story for the week. And as I was driving up there, I heard on the radio, WCCO of course, that Duluth police were reporting a double homicide in Duluth. But there were no further details. They didn't, they didn't have any information. So I'm driving up there and I'm thinking, all right, strawberries, double homicide. What would be more interesting if I'm going that way? So I pulled over, uh, I think everybody here, some groups I talked to, I have to explain, we didn't have cell phones back then. <laughs> so I had to find a gas station and call on the payphone. And luckily for me, the editors hadn't heard about it yet in Minneapolis. It hadn't come over the wires. So the editor in charge that early that morning said, oh, go ahead, Joe, why don't you keep going up to Duluth and figure out what happened? Uh, what harm could it do? So I kept going up and I got there and I asked the police station what, something about murders and they said just go up London Road you'll figure it out and I got there where the mansion is and there were police cars lined up along the road and the yellow police tape covering uh, the, the sidewalk there and it was very obvious that I was in the right place and a police officer came out and told me and the others gathered there that Elizabeth Congdon, who was 83 years old, had been murdered that, that night in her bed. And Ms. Congdon was partially paralyzed after a stroke, so she needed round-the-clock nursing. And the nurse who was on duty that night had also been killed. It was the two women were killed in the mansion. The nurse was beaten to death on the stairway and Ms. Congdon was smothered with a satin pillow in her bed. And she couldn't, of course, flee or get away because of her, her uh, paralysis. Now at the time, right then, they said someone broke into the mansion and stole things and killed the two women during the burglary. So the official story at the beginning was that it was a burglary gone awry. And there were things missing. There was jewelry missing from the mansion, from Miss Congdon's bedroom. The killer had actually taken her ring off her finger. And the other things were taken too. There was a gold coin, ancient Byzantine coin, that had been, was missing from her dresser that, that they knew that, that had been taken. So uh, this is a bigger story than anyone had expected, of course, because Miss Congdon was the last a surviving uh, child of Chester Congdon, who was a mining uh, magnate. He, he made millions of dollars in iron ore uh, profits on the Iron Range. And he is the one who actually built Glen Sheen, the mansion. And it was finished in 1906, and it cost almost a million dollars then to build. So it was a, he had a lot of money, and he was uh, well known in Duluth. He, he gave to uh, charities. He was, he was uh, by all accounts, a good man. He was also a legislator, but he died young. He only uh, lived at the mansion for a few years before he died. But his wife and the youngest daughter, Elizabeth, continued to live in the mansion. And Elizabeth, who was killed, actually never married 
but she adopted two daughters in the 1930s, which was unusual in those days for a single person to adopt, but the Congdons had lots of money and of course probably could make it happen. So I'm learning a little bit of history about who the Congdons were and why they had this huge mansion. Now that morning when I'm up there, it was almost impossible to tell there was a mansion behind all the trees. In Miss Congdon's later years, she had kind of let things go a little bit and the bushes and trees were covering the mansion. Now today it's all been trimmed and when you drive by going up to the North Shore, you can tell it's a mansion because they want you to come and visit it. But in those days, Miss Congdon didn't have all that many visitors and it was kind of hard to tell there was a mansion there where the murders had been committed. And we're just out on the street. Now there was a photographer who was supposed to come with me to do the strawberries. <laughs> and she had a radio in her car, so we were able to call her on the radio and say, don't go to the strawberries, go to Duluth. So she showed up and uh, the two of us are trying to figure out how we can best do this story without being able to see the mansion. So I noticed that there were some little kids running around trying to figure out what had happened here with all the police cars. And I asked them if anyone knew if there was someone who had a boat that we could take out on the lake and take a picture from the lake side of the mansion to go with the story. And one of the little boys said, oh, I live just down the road and we have a boat. So the photographer and I went to his house and checked with his mother to make sure it was okay and gave him $10. And so he went out on the lake with the photographer and so we took a picture of the mansion from the lakeside. So I called into the office and told them all the information that we had about who the two women were who were killed and what the details as little as we knew so that we could have the story in the paper in the morning. And that's when the editor told me, he said, you need to stay overnight so you're there tomorrow and continue to cover this. And I said, oh no, I, I can't, I don't have any clothes. I, I, I gotta go back home. And they said, no, just stay overnight, stay in that round hotel, it's the, uh, the Radisson up there, and then just buy some, buy some underwear and stuff. So, so I did, I stayed. And the next morning I got up and I went down to the lobby and I found our Minneapolis Tribune newspaper. And there on the front page was my first big front page story ever that Duluth heiress murdered in mansion. And we had the picture of the mansion from the lake. So we had this really good picture. And I, uh, I was thinking, all right, I, I did pretty good here. I was a young rookie reporter. I got a front page story. So I called the office and they said, what are you gonna do for today? And I said, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> they said, well, figure it out. So I remembered when the police officer was talking the first day, the bodies were found that morning by the day nurse who was coming to work and take care of Ms. Congdon. She was coming at 7 a.m. and she found the bodies, they told us. And I knew her name was Mildred Garview. So I looked in the phone book, we had phone books back then, and called and nobody answered. So I drove to the address and there was a, a man cutting the grass early that morning and I went up and introduced myself and I said, I'm from the Minneapolis paper and I'm here to interview Nurse Garview about the murders. And the guy kind of took me, put his arm around me and said, son, I've got a couple problems here. First of all, my wife is Mildred and she was very good friends with the two women who were killed. With Elizabeth, she'd been taking care of Elizabeth for many, many months and the nurse who was killed was named Velma Piedla. She had hired Mildred, and so she knew these women very, very well, and she'd found them brutally murdered, and was very, very distressed about this. And he said, she just can't even talk about it, it's so distressing to her. And I felt really bad, like I was intruding on this family and somehow was gonna make things worse. And so I said, oh, I, I am so, so sorry to have bothered you. And then he said, the other thing, son, all the other reporters were here yesterday. <laughs> so I was not only intruding on the family, I was a day late. So I really, seems like I kind of screwed up on that. But then for some reason, 
This man and I started just chatting a little bit, and it turned out he was the athletic director at one of the Duluth high schools. And as it happened, my mom's brother, my uncle, was the choir director at the same high school. So he knew my uncle Dick. And so we chatted a little bit about this and kind of getting along okay. And then a car drove up and a woman got out and had two armfuls of groceries. And the man said, honey, come here. You gotta meet this guy. It's Dick Roby's nephew. <laughs> and I could just, I could today still see her rolling her eyes like, what, 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 yeah, what has my husband got me into now? You know, we've, we've all been there. So she invited me in, even in her distress, and I sat at her kitchen table for like two hours as she told me about what had happened that morning the, the day before. And the key thing, there are two really key things. The first thing was the scene of the crime, because the police hadn't told us much of anything. But, but Mildred told me how she'd come to work. The first thing she noticed that seemed out of place was the front door, that big, huge wooden door at the front when you take the tour, was unlocked. And so she thought, somebody screwed up here and forgot to lock up last night. Well, of course, as it turns out, the killer left through the front door and you know, didn't have a key to lock it up. But that was the first thing. She then went into the kitchen to talk to the cook about breakfast for Ms. Congdon. Now, when you take the tour, you, there, there's a second part of the house, the servants' quarters, and there were two women working there who were stayed overnight and were in the mansion during the murders, but on the servants' side of it, which has a very thick door and walls, a cook and a, and a maid. And so at this point, no one knew what had happened, and the cook was in the kitchen. And so after that, the nurse, if you can picture the house there, is coming back through kind of the main entryway and the stairway, the grand stairway going up and then into the bedrooms is on her right. And she noticed out of the corner of her eye, she said, her friend Velma, the, the night nurse, was lying on that window seat halfway up on the landing. And she said, I, I couldn't imagine what was going on. She said, is Velma taking a nap? You know, it was her first thought. She just couldn't put her head around the fact that, she, that something terrible had happened. But then, as she got closer, she saw that Velma had been beaten. There was blood on the wall. Uh, there was a candlestick holder that had been used to actually pummel her, was laying there. And she checked her friend's pulse and, and realized that she was dead. And then she told me, I realized Miss Congdon was upstairs alone. So she raced up that last part of the stairway, came in and found Miss Congdon lying on the bed with the pillow still over her face. And there was jewelry strewn on the ground and drawers were open so someone had rifled through her stuff. And she said one of the things that we noticed the police, when the police were there is, um, you know, the, the gold coin was missing, the, 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 the uh, ring was missing, all these things that, that uh, police talked about for the burglary. Then she's panicking, so she runs back downstairs, finds the cook, and they call 911 and say, something terrible has happened. There's been two people are dead. And while she was explaining this, and after she told them what had happened, she thought the phone went dead. And she and the cook thought that the killer was still there and had cut the phone line and was coming to get them next. And they huddled in fear in the kitchen. You can imagine uh, uh, how terrifying this would be. Well, it turned out that the 911 operator had put them on mute while she was busy sending off police cars from all, all around town. And so it never was cut off, but they thought it was. And even to this day, I get chills thinking what that would be like if I was sitting there, just found two bodies, and thought someone else was coming to get me. It's just uh, awful, awful to think about. But the police soon arrived, checked everywhere, and the killer was gone. Nobody was there. And they, um, they checked the outside and everything, and, and so, so they were OK. Now, as the nurse is telling me about the scene of the crime, I'm trying to draw a little picture of the staircase. I had never been in the mansion, and they wouldn't let us in. Of course, it was a crime scene. So I didn't have any idea of what it was like. So I'm drawing a picture where the nurse was found. And Mildred, the nurse, actually took my notebook 
and drew in the picture of the staircase and where, where there was uh, uh, blood on the wall. And then she drew Miss Congdon's bedroom so I'd understand, so I'd get it right. I think she thought I would get, I'd screw it up if she didn't help me. So she, she made very nice notes and drawing of, of the crime scene. And that was really helpful. Now, and this is way more than the police had told us. So suddenly I kind of have a scoop here about what the murders were like that, that morning. But then, after we finished with that, then Mildred, the nurse, actually told me some other things that, we, in retrospect, were even more important. Because at this point, remember, I, I didn't know who the Congdons were other than this quick little uh, de definition that the police had given us. But the stories that had been in the paper and on TV were just elderly heiress murdered. And it was like she was a crime statistic because we didn't know anything about her. But Mildred, the nurse, told me a few stories about Ms. Congdon so I could understand better that this was a real person who was valued and a great loss. Her death would be a great loss to the community, to her family. Uh, and, and she told me things like Ms. Congdon loved classical music. And in almost every room of the mansion, she liked to either have a radio on or a record player to play music. And she loved Chopin, was her favorite. And so I'm getting a little idea of that this was a real person, not just a statistic. Um, she said she loved, Miss Congdon loved to have tea parties at the mansion. That's how she entertained her social set. They'd come and play cards and get served tea and I guess scones is what, what they do. Uh, but after her stroke, Miss Congdon, it was real hard for her to do that and play cards because she only could use one hand. One hand was incapacitated. So the handyman at the mansion made her one of those little stands, a little tray, sort of like Scrabble, so that she could set her cards in there and continue to, ha to play cards and have her friends over and still have this social life, even though she'd had the, the stroke. And Miss Congdon loved to drive around Duluth or be driven around Duluth and, and see the lake when you're driving along the hills, you look out, it's a beautiful sight, as, as everyone knows, it goes to Duluth. And there's a Congdon Boulevard and a Congdon School and a Congdon Park. And she'd like to go and, and look at that. It was her father's legacy. And she was really proud of, of what her family had done in Duluth. But apparently they had just gotten a new car at the mansion and the windows were kind of high. And it was hard for Miss Congdon sitting in the back to see out very well. So the nurse told me that the way they solved that was they put some telephone books on the, on the seat so Miss Congdon would be up higher and be able to see. And when I heard that, I thought, boy, that doesn't really sound like maybe the richest woman in Minnesota is, is sitting on telephone books. And so this really helped personalize for me what Miss Congdon was like and the loss that, that really was hitting the community. And I felt like it was better than just old lady killed, which sometimes is all we're able to write at the paper. But this time we knew a little bit more about her. So I felt really good about that. And so I, I, uh, I did a story about everything she told me. I was able to transmit those little drawings back to the paper so they could make what we call a graphic out of it, like a map of the two crime scenes, the stairway and the bed. And I woke up the next morning and went down to the lobby, and there again, the second day in a row, front page story with my byline on it, and we had those pictures of the crime scene, which no one else had. The Duluth paper probably had 30 reporters working on this case, and I, and I scooped them. You know, it seemed like I did good. And I was feeling, I was feeling maybe I do know how to be a, a news reporter. And I was feeling pride, and we all know where that leads us. <laughs> Because I called into the office about noon, to, I wanted to hear my praises being. <laughs> and they said, yeah, yeah, it was a fine story, but we got a real problem with your story. And I thought I'd spelled somebody's name wrong. You know, like we do that once in a while. But instead, the editor told me that they'd just gotten a call from the Minnesota Nursing Society. And it turned out that my nurse, Mildred, who just spent all this time and helped me, had been a nurse at the hospital in Duluth previously 
and had been caught five years ago stealing drugs and using them and had been fired and I, I lost her nurse's license, de-nursed, whatever, whatever you call it. And the paper said, we have to write a story that the nurse who found Ms. Congdon's body had been fired and was a drug addict, basically. And I said, no, we can't write that because that would, that would be the terrible thing to put on this woman who had just helped me so much with, with the information about the case. And they said, it doesn't matter what you think, we're gonna write a story. And I protested and I was loudly shouted down, said, we're doing the story. And the question is, Joe, do you want to interview her about this or should we have another reporter? And I said, well, I have to because of what I'd been through with her. So I called her and said, Mildred, we just heard this news that you'd had a problem. And she said, it's true. I did have a drug problem and I was caught, but I've been through rehab. I don't use drugs anymore. And most importantly, the Congdon doctors knew about it when they hired me. I wasn't trying to sneak in and get a job illegally or anything. And so I said, well, that, that's really good. And I'm gonna put that in the story. Uh, but then I felt so bad, I said, I'm worried that when our story's in the paper tomorrow morning, all the TV and radio and news people are gonna come to your house and make you talk again about this terrible part of your life. And I suggested maybe that she, if she had a, a cabin or somewhere she could go for the weekend to, to just to get away so that she wouldn't be bothered anymore. And so then we hung up and the next morning we did do a story. It was not a front page story and it was just a short story, but basically said nurse who found bodies had been fired from the hospital for stealing drugs. And I really, really felt bad about that because she had been so helpful to me and, and, and so gracious and given me this information. And that was always a heavy, weighed heavy on my heart, even though some of these other stories were going really well, I, I really felt like I would kind of messed up someone's life and it didn't seem necessary to me, I felt bad. So now we just need to quickly, to finish this story, move five years ahead. And by then, there'd been two trials that I'd covered. I'd been covering this story pretty much nonstop for five years, knew everything about it. And they opened the mansion for the tours then. Up until then, it had been uh, a crime scene, and so you couldn't get in. So they opened the tours, and I went on one of the first ones because I, uh, I'd never been in there. I wanted to see it. I'd been writing about it for so long. And so my wife and I went to one of the early tours, and the young tour guide, to open up the tour, said, Welcome to Glensheen. When Miss Congdon passed away, she willed the mansion to the University of Minnesota Duluth, which is true. But then I took the, the, the young girl aside and I said, you know that she didn't just pass away. She was brutally murdered. I thought maybe they hadn't told her. <laughs> and she said, no, no, we're not supposed to say anything about that. I said, we've been told not to say anything. And I said, well, I think that's why we're all here. <laughs> and she said, no, no, we can't talk about it. So that was the genesis of my idea that I needed to do a book of some kind to tell people what had happened, where in the mansion, and I had, I had the maps of the mansion, because when people went on the tour, they did wanna, I felt they might wanna know which bedroom it was. So I self-published the first version of my book. I've constantly updated it, because as many of you know, Marjorie, who's gonna become a major character here, keeps doing things, and so I have to update it constantly. But the first version of the book came out and I, I just hired a printer and just did it on my own. Well, it turns out you need a distributor to sell books. I didn't know this. So I went to the guy in Minneapolis and said, can, I wrote a book, can you, can you uh, sell it for me? And he says, oh, I don't think so. And I was crushed. And he could, I think he felt sorry for me. He said, okay, give me a hundred of them and I'll take them to a couple bookstores and see if anybody has any interest. And I said, oh good, I'm gonna be an author. And I started thinking, okay, my mom will buy one and my brother. <laughs> I wasn't sure I could get to 100, but I was hoping. Three days later, this man called me back and said, we need 5,000 right away because there was this pent up demand from people taking the tours who wanted to know about the murders. So I did, and there was some publicity about me in the book. And I did a book signing in Duluth right away 
at the Miller Hill Mall at the bookstore, and it was in the paper. And I walked in the store that night, and the phone was ringing off at the counter, and someone said, Mr. Kimball, it's for you. And I took the phone. I thought it was one of my kids was sick. I couldn't imagine who would be calling. And the f phone said, Joe, this is Mildred Garview, my nurse. And she said, I see you're in Duluth and you wrote a book. She said, I'm really mad at you. And I said, well, of course you are, Mildred. This has been the, sad the saddest part for me was how we dealt with you after the case. And she said, oh, no, no, not about that. She said, you, you were just doing your job and it was all true. She said, I'm mad because I see you wrote a book about Miss Congdon and the murders and you didn't call me. I could have told you lots more stories and given you pictures and things. So Mildred had forgiven me and this huge weight lifted off and, and uh, God bless Mildred. Uh, she has since died, but, uh, but she, she was a, a good person who just had a hard time. All right, now we're going back to the mansion. It's the week after the murders, and they're making me stay up there. They said, just keep staying, and nothing's happening. There's no news. I have to try to figure stuff out to write. So one of the stories I did, I wrote a story about the police lieutenant in charge of the case. His name was Lieutenant Ernie Grams, and he was kind of one of these guys like Kojak, you know, kind of gruff. He had a cigar that he didn't light, but he always had it. But inside, you know, the marshmallow guy, you know, he's just a real, it turned out to be a nice guy, but he was gruff on the outside. And so the story I wrote about how he was trying to solve the biggest murder ever in Duluth's history, and he was working round the clock to do this. And in, in about the second paragraph of the story, I, I said, he's known around town as the Duluth sleuth, which I thought was really, really funny. And everybody else thought it was stupid. <laughs> But he kind of liked it. And so partly because of that, he kind of took me under his wing a little bit. He felt sorry for me again. And it turned out he had been a reporter, his first job out of the army, he'd been a reporter at the Duluth paper, but always wanted to be a cop. So he knew what I was going through, how hard, uh, that, I, that I wasn't doing that, that well. And so he offered me a place to sit near his office and hang up my coat and put my notebooks and things. So I, I had a little base in the police station because of Ernie. Well, after about six days of no news, no details other than what we already knew, I started hearing officers in the hallway talking about Denver and Colorado. And I first thought, why are they going skiing when they should be solving a murder? I couldn't understand. But then one morning it dawned on me, I said, oh my gosh, something's happening in Denver with the case. So I called the office back in Minneapolis and said, I don't know what it is, but they're talking about Denver. Well, unbeknownst to me, after I hung up, the editor sent another reporter from Minneapolis straight to Denver right that morning to be in play in case something happened. And I went back to the police station and set up an appointment for late afternoon to talk to them about this. So I walked in probably about three o'clock, and I said, uh, Lieutenant Grams. And he said, what do you want? And I said, I want to know about Denver. And he said, what do you know about Denver? And I said, I know all about Denver. <laughs> <laughs> I was bluffing. <laughs> and he said, okay, that's not good. Uh -huh. he, he said, we're working the case. We're not ready to be public with what we've got yet, but I'll make you a deal, Joe. He said, I'll tell you the background and what's going on, and you have to promise not to write anything right away until we're ready to make an arrest, because I don't want to tip them off that we're on their case. And he said, if you'll promise that, then I'll make, the deal is, you will be the first reporter I call when we arrest someone in the Congdon murders. And I thought, wow, this is great. Of course, I want to know what happened. And that's when I heard the real story of what had happened First time at all I'd heard any family involvement. And it turned out that, as I mentioned, Miss Congdon had adopted the two daughters, raised them there at Glensheen, Jennifer and Marjorie. Jennifer married a man from Racine, Wisconsin, had a family. He started a company and she had lots of money, her family beyond the Congdon money. But Marjorie was a problem. Even as a child, she'd gotten into trouble in Duluth. There were reports that she'd steal stuff from the department stores and mom would have to go and write a check and kind of clear things up. 
They never called the police because they didn't want any scandal. The Congdons didn't want scandal, I guess. And Marjorie was troublesome for Miss Congdon, uh, even as a girl. She married, though, as a young woman, an accountant from Minneapolis, Richard Leroy, and they actually had seven children living in the Twin Cities. And he made a, good, a, a decent living, but Marjorie kept spending way more than, they could, than he could come up with. She always wanted a new couch, even when the, new one, the other one was just six months old. Uh, she, she wanted clothes for the kids. She'd buy, they were skaters, some of her kids, and she'd buy a dozen sweaters of the same kind just so that they'd have enough. She always wanted more. And because her husband couldn't, couldn't afford it, she'd often go up to Duluth to have mom write a check to supplement her income so she could do it. Well, eventually, the accountant got tired of this and they divorced. And this is in the early 1970s now. They'd been married 20 some years. Marjorie then moved to Denver and suddenly Denver makes sense now. The, young, the daughter lives there and police are investigating that. It's starting to come to, together. And the, and the officer said that even as an adult, there'd been some problems with Marjorie. She had blown, her mother had set up a million dollar trust for each of the daughters, and they were just supposed to get the interest of, from it. Marjorie had convinced the bankers to give her the whole principal and had spent the whole million dollars in one year. And then after Miss Congdon had the stroke, Marjorie was, went up there one day and the nurses saw this she went up and took her mom's hand and signed a check for $20,000, and her mom didn't seem to know what was going on. And so the nurse reported this, and the Congdon trustees, who were in charge of all the business holdings and everything, they decided Miss Congdon could no longer have any control over her financial affairs because she was giving money to Marjorie. So they cut her off. They said, no more. She, she, Marjorie gets no more. And she's living in Denver now. They also police learned about a family reunion that the Congdons had had at the mansion about a year or two before the murders. And Congdons from around the country had come and had a wonderful, lovely time and a picnic. But that night, Miss Congdon, Elizabeth, became deathly ill. Something terrible was in her system and they tried to test what it was and the doctor surmised that it must be some kind of a poison or something. And then one of the cousins remembered, you know, Marjorie, had brought marmalade, homemade marmalade, to the party. And they remembered that she'd put some on toast for her mom. She said, here, taste what, what I just made. And they started thinking, maybe that was why she's so sick. So they searched the house to try to find it so they could test it, and it was gone. And by then, Marjorie had already left. But of course, they didn't, again, didn't call the police or anything because they couldn't prove it, and they didn't want any scandal. But now, after the murders, they were telling the police, this is why we think Marjorie might be involved. So based on this evidence, the police went to Denver where Marjorie was living. And soon after she'd moved there, she actually met, she was divorced, and met a man named Roger Caldwell who was from Pennsylvania and also divorced, and he had no job either. So the two of them are living in Denver, and now that they've been cut off from the mansion, they're basically broke. And I got to know Roger quite a bit afterwards. We'll talk about him. He, he was the second husband. And he told me later that they were so broke living in Denver that they had, their house had been, re, had been foreclosed on, and they each had a Jeep that they were driving. They'd been repossessed by the bank. So they, they're clearly broke. Roger even told me that they used to use slugs in a pop machine because he couldn't even come up with a quarter. Well. Police are very interested in this, so they start asking more people about it. And it turns out at the same time when they're totally broke, Roger and Marjorie were touring ranches in the mountains and telling the real estate people that they were going to be buying a, a multi-million dollar ranch very soon and her mother would be paying for it, even though she'd been cut off and they had no money. So police are getting all of this evidence that maybe Marjorie might have been behind this with a motive to speed up her inheritance because they were broke. Based on this, they went and got a search warrant and searched. She, they had their house foreclosed, so they moved into a tiny little motel 
in Golden, Colorado. The police went there to search it because they wanted to gather evidence in the days after the murders. And the first thing they found at this motel was in the lobby of the, the where the letter, the letter box. Now, Roger, uh, Marjorie and Roger had left Denver two days after the murders to come back to Minnesota for the funeral. So they're not in Denver at this time. So this letter that had arrived for them had not been opened. There was a, uh, and they, so the police got it and they looked at it and it was addressed to Mr. Roger Caldwell, the new husband, and it was postmarked Duluth, the day of the murders. So someone had mailed it from Duluth that day. Inside the envelope, the only thing inside was that gold Byzantine coin that had been stolen from the mansion. So someone who'd been in there, stole the coin, mailed it from Duluth, and mailed it to Roger and Marjorie. And, and they determined that the handwriting was Roger's, that he'd self-addressed the envelope. And then they did a quick check, and they found a thumbprint on the back of the envelope that looked like it was Roger's. So now they're thinking Roger is the one who physically went to Duluth, committed the murders, and came back. They couldn't find anyone who'd seen Roger the day of the murders in Denver. They'd seen Marjorie, but no one had seen Roger. So they're starting to get some pretty good evidence here that he was behind the murders. And then the, the other thing they found, there was a safe deposit box at the hotel, and they opened it, and it got with the search warrant, and found a handwritten will that Marjorie had handwritten, and basically it said, I promised to share $2.5 million of my inheritance with my new husband, Roger. And so the police felt that that was the carrot, that Mar Marjorie said, if you'll go and take care of my mother, you'll get the money guaranteed because it's in writing. So the police are putting all these things together, and they're really close to making an arrest. Roger and Marjorie were actually in the Twin Cities after the funeral in Duluth and, and still here, and they knew where they were, and they'd talked to them, and they were this close to making an arrest, but they weren't ready yet. And so that was what the police officer told me. And I thought, oh my gosh. So I went and called the office and said, well, I know what happened, but we can't write about it. And the editor blew his stack. He said, are you kidding? Our job at the newspaper is to find things out and tell the readers, not to find things out and keep secrets. And I said, well, yeah, but I promised. And he said, you can't make a promise. Reporters can't do that. That's not allowed. It's not right. And I said, well, I'm very, very sorry. And then he said, it doesn't matter. We're going to do the story anyway. And I said, what do you mean? Well, remember the other reporter who'd gone to Denver that morning? The first thing she did when she got there was check at the courthouse and found that search warrant that they'd filed. And it was public record. Anyone who walked in could look at that. And it listed almost the exact same things the officer had told me. So we had it at a second source with no privacy concerns or anything. So the editor said, we're doing the story, start writing it. And he, again, then the editor told me, he said, we need to interview the cop. So do you want to call him or should we have another reporter? And I said, well, I have to call him again. You know, I felt that I was invested in this. So I called him and said what we were doing, that we found the search warrant. We were going to write a story that said son-in-law investigated in Congdon murders. And the, all he said to me was, now we have to lay all our cards on the table. And then he hung up. We wrote the story, and it was in the state edition that, that they print about 10 o'clock at night that goes to Duluth and Mankato. And the front page, first time any mention of a family member in the, in the Congdon case publicly, son-in-law suspected, investigated in Congdon murders. I was getting ready to go to bed that night, close to midnight, and the phone rang. And it was Lieutenant Grams, the cop. And he said, Joe, I promised you you'd be the first reporter I call if we make an arrest. And we decided, because the story was going to be in the paper the next morning, we needed to arrest them now. And I said, really? You called me, even though I didn't live up to my end of the bargain? And he said, no, I promised you. And we did arrest Roger Caldwell um, at a hospital in St. Louis Park. He had thought he was having a heart attack and was in the hospital, and they thought they better get him. So they did arrest him.
So I was able to quickly rewrite the top of the story that's the, about where he'd been arrested and some details of it. And I called the office for the, and for the first and only time of my career, I was able to say, stop the presses. <laughs> and they did, and they remade the story. So the next morning in the paper that we all got down here said, son-in-law arrested in Congdon murders. So we got a big scoop on that. Well, Roger then went to trial. And they moved the trial from Duluth to Brainerd because they thought everybody in Duluth knew about the case. And I would have argued that everybody in Brainerd probably knew about it too because there was a lot of publicity about it. But it was a year later after the murders, there was the trial in Brainerd. And so I got to cover that. I, uh, it was three months long. I had to stay at Grandview Lodge for three months on expense account. It was very hard, very difficult. <laughs> There were 109 witnesses. Everybody, everybody who'd been investigating at the mansion and they talked to people in, in Denver and they were showing that they were broke and that the motive was greed to speed up the inheritance. But it's just Roger at this point. And they had that envelope with the thumbprint, which basically said, if that's his thumbprint and the postmark, he was in Duluth that day. And they had an expert who said, yes, that is his thumbprint, told the jury. Now, it wasn't a slam dunk case because no one had seen him in Duluth. No one, there was no eyewitnesses. And that was kind of hard. They also couldn't show how he'd gotten from Denver to Minnesota and back. They didn't, they, they, in these days, it's easy to track us on an airplane because you have to have all your ID and everything. Back then, they thought he might have faked it, given a fake name and done it, and they just couldn't put him on an airplane. So there were some holes in the case, uh, but it seemed pretty, pretty tight to me. And so after, th after the three-month trial, the jury deliberated three days, and they found him guilty of both murders. And that seemed right to me. You know, I, I felt that he probably must have done it. Now, I actually got to talk to him a little bit in this Brainerd courthouse. It's one of those old-fashioned ones, and we'd have to wait in the hallway each day for the trial to start before we could go in, and they'd bring Roger in, <laughs> you know, in handcuffs, and he'd walk by us, and sometimes he'd stop and say, hey, how'd the twins do last night, you know? So we just kind of chatted a little bit and got to, I got to hear his voice and things. Uh, but I was quite certain that he must have done it, and so I felt good about the, about the verdict. The very next day, the prosecutor in Duluth announced that they were charging Marjorie with planning the crime. They were pretty convinced that Roger couldn't have done this on his own. And I agree, Roger was, he was not the, the forceful go get him type. Um, we used to use the word milk toast kind of guy, you know, yes dear, yes dear, yes dear. I think uh, that's how I felt about Roger as I got to know him over the years. So they decided Marjorie had to have been involved. Now, her trial got moved to Hastings, Minnesota, again because of the pretrial publicity, and there was another year before the trial. So Marjorie did a few things that actually were smart. First thing she did was she hired a lawyer who I think everybody will have heard of named Ron Meshbesher. And Mesh was really, really good in the 70s. He had many cases with murder cases that we were convinced the guy did it, and, my, and Mesh got him off. I mean, he, was, he really was sharp. I always told my wife, if we do it, we're going to hire Ronnie. <laughs> but we never did it. So Mesh Pesher then went back over the case with a fine-tooth comb, and he had the transcript of the first trial so he knew every question that was going to be asked, and he was looking for ways to, to try to get her off with that information. And he sent an investigator back to Denver to re-interview all the people there one year later after the murders. This is during the year afterwards. And lots of people had seen Marjorie that day the day of the murders in Denver. She went to the bank and the laundromat and uh, the grocery store, almost like she was setting up an alibi. <laughs> like, I'm, uh, I'm here, everybody see me. But no one had seen Roger for the two days around the murders. 
But this guy, the investigator, went and asked again, just does anybody see it? And he found a waitress at the motel coffee shop who had told police she'd, never, she'd seen Marjorie but not Roger. Well, now this woman says, you know, I might have seen Roger that day. And the investigator said, really? He couldn't believe his good luck. And he said, would you be willing to come and testify? And he, she said, sure, if you'll pay my way, come to Minnesota. And so she did. And she did testify at the trial that she had seen Roger the morning of the murders, which of course meant he couldn't have been in Duluth and committed them. So that was a, one of the things that Meshbesher got. The next thing, remember the thumbprint on the envelope. Meshbesher found an expert on the East Coast who for about maybe $15,000 agreed to come and testify. And he said, I'm not sure that is Rogers. There's reasonable doubt. It could be someone else. And at the first trial, no one had disputed it. It had just been accepted that that was Rogers. Now, it's been in dispute. I talked to jurors later after this, and I said, what do you think about the thumbprint testimony? And they said, well, one guy says it's Rogers, the other one says it's not. We didn't know. We're not experts. We just decided not to count the, the fingerprint, which really hurt the case. And then the third thing that kind of went well for Marjorie on this is Marjorie herself. And I'm betting maybe somebody knows her or certainly knows people who know her. But Marjorie, by all accounts, is one of those people who when you first meet her, she's kind of bubbly and attractive and people kind of, kind of like her. You know, she seems to have good ideas and she smiles a lot and laughs. But many people, after a while, suddenly they realize, well, you know, she lies a lot and she talks behind my back. And many, many people then decide they don't want anything to do with Marjorie after they've gotten to know her a little bit better. Well, the jurors in this case in Hastings, they didn't have all that much time to really get to know the real Marjorie, and they'd just see her every morning. She'd kind of look at them and kind of wave in the morning when they filed in. And she always had a book at the table. She's sitting at the front, and whenever there was a break, she'd sit and read. And when there was testimony going on in the trial, Marjorie knitted at the table. And she wasn't really looking like a murderess. She was looking more like a grandmother, you know, and it, it, just setting up this perception of someone who would never, ever want to kill their mother. In fact, Meshbesher had a birthday during the trial, and Marjorie made her a cake and brought it and set it on the defense table. And at one of the breaks, they cut it, and the lawyers had a piece, and they offered a piece to the prosecutor. And he said, no way. He says, I know about the marmalade. <laughs> but all of these things are kind of presenting this image of Marjorie as uh, not, not necessarily the evil person that the prosecution's trying to, uh, to explain. And so I guess when the trial, it's in 109 witnesses again, the same kind of stuff, but at the end of this trial, the jury deliberated less than two days, and I shouldn't have been surprised, but I really was, they found her not guilty. They decided with the envelope, envelope evidence and the waitress that there was a reasonable doubt that she, she was, had done it. And so she was acquitted. I went the next day to interview Meshbesher in his office because I wanted to ask him, how did you pull this rabbit out of a hat like this? I really was curious. And while I was there, one of the jurors called him because they wanted to get Marjorie's phone number because they were going to have a juror party and they wanted to invite Marjorie. So they really liked her, you can tell. Now, I, I told Meshbesher, find out when it is because I want to go. <laughs> and it looks like they never did it. Marjorie at least didn't go to it. But the fact that they asked sort of shows that they really did like Marjorie. So she's free of the murders. Based on that new evidence, though, Roger, who's been in Stillwater Prison on the life, two life terms, he has his lawyer file a new appeal saying there's new evidence, the thumbprint and the waitress. And so that takes a couple years to go through the court system. And finally, about five years after the murders, the Minnesota Supreme Court ruled that, yes, that evidence was enough to give Roger a new trial. So they had to let him go, 
to await the new trial. And he returned to his home of Latrobe, Pennsylvania, to wait the new trial. Well, this was a real problem for the prosecutor in Duluth because Marjorie got off. If they try Roger again and lose, then they have the biggest murder of the century unsolved. And they were pretty sure they knew who did it. But if he got off, then they looked like idiots and, and with an unsolved murder. Witnesses are forgetting things, and some witnesses had actually died. So they, they could see a problem coming up ahead to have this second trial. So their solution was, let's try to do a plea bargain. And so the first thing they did was offer Roger, if he'd plead guilty to second degree murder, they would give him just three more years in prison and then he'd be released. Because it would be second degree instead of first degree. And Roger said no. And they thought, okay, we've got to sweeten the pot. They said, okay, plead guilty one more year. And Roger still said no. Finally, almost in desperation, their final offer was, okay, if you plead guilty to the murders, we'll let you go now. No more jail time. And I asked Roger later, I said, what did you think about that when they, when they offered you the deal? And he said, where, I asked him, where do I sign? Because he did not want to risk spending the rest of his life in prison when they offered him such a sweetheart deal as this. So they brought Roger back from Pennsylvania and up to Duluth courtroom, and they did it on a holiday weekend, like Monday of the 4th of July. So the courts were closed and no one knew what was happening because they knew people would be mad if they're going to let him go after confessing to killing the two women. But he got up on the, on the stand and gave a confession that was very, very vague. It didn't answer a lot of those questions that we want to know, like how did he get from Denver to Minneapolis and back and all those kinds of things. And the reason he said, I just don't remember. He said, I was really drunk. And so all of these important details, he just said, I was too drunk to remember. But he did confess and said, I did it. I was there. I did it. So this, they had to be satisfied with that vague confession and let him go. This case was solved. Roger admitted to it. And he left. Now, I didn't find out about this till the next day when the courts opened and everybody said, oh, by the way, Roger, <laughs> Roger confessed yesterday. And I told the editors in Minneapolis, I said, I need to go find him. I knew where he lived. You know, I had his address from, a, from his relatives. And they said, oh, no, we don't, we don't need to do that. It's five years ago. People don't care about the Congdon murders anymore. And I said, well, I think they do. He said, nah, we're not going to spend the money to send you out to, to Pittsburgh and Latrobe. So I was very disappointed, and I went home that night. And later, when I, after I was home, the phone rang, and it was Roger's sister-in-law in Latrobe, Pennsylvania. And she said, hey, Joe, are you coming out to interview Roger? And I said, no, they won't let me. She said, oh, that's too bad. She said, you know, there's a reporter from the St. Paul Pioneer Press who just showed up asking questions. And I said, really? So I went back the next morning, told the editor, he said, the Pioneer's there. And they said, why aren't you there? I said, you wouldn't let me. He said, get going. So I did. I flew immediately to, to there. And I knew where he lived. So I took the rental car and I knocked on the door and no answer and it was getting dark. So I thought, I'm just going to wait for him. And I figured he'd come toddling drunk back, you know, from the bar and I'd be able to interview him and maybe get something out of him, you know, in that condition. So I waited in the car about a half block away. And the next thing I know, it was like four in the morning. I'd fallen asleep. <laughs> and then I went and tried to find him and had no luck finding him. So I wanted to talk to his parents and his relatives just as long as I was there to try to figure out you know, more about Roger. And the brother and sister-in-law were very helpful and met with me, but the parents wanted nothing to do with it. You know, They didn't want to talk to some reporter from Minnesota. So I was getting ready to leave and I hadn't interviewed Roger. And I had one last lunch with the brother and his wife. And as I, the last thing I said was, I said, you know, if I could just meet your parents Maybe they don't want to really say much, but I'd like to be able to tell my editor that I at least had an interview with Roger's parents because I, I, I was kind of striking out so far. I didn't have much to, come, to go with. And I said, I'm not the kind of guy who's going to stick a microphone in their face and say, what's it like to raise a killer? You know, I, I'm not that kind of person. 
I'm, I'm going to be, I just, just want to meet him. And the brother said, well, okay, let me check. And so he left the table and to call his dad. And he, five minutes later, he came back, and something terrible clearly had happened. He was walking, oh, and he was all ashen-faced. And my first thought was, oh, my gosh, Roger killed someone else. I mean, something clearly had happened. And he sat down and he said, our family is reeling because of something that just was in the paper today. He said, until now, there had been no mention in the Latrobe paper or TV news or anything about my brother, Roger. And so my parents didn't have to deal with questions at church or at their condo. And no one, no one knew that, that someone in our family had committed these murders. But today, this day that I'm there, the front page of the Latrobe paper, the, the afternoon paper came out at noon, and it said, Latrobe man returns home from Minnesota after murders. And the whole case was laid out. And they were just sick at heart because now everybody in town knew about Roger. And the parents were really sad. And then he said, you're not going to believe this. He says, in the story, his dad read him the story, there was a line in there that said, the information about these Minnesota murders was given to us by a reporter from the St. Paul newspaper who had come and was looking for Roger. He'd gone to the newspaper to check their circulation records. He thought he could find Roger's address by, by looking uh, where they delivered the paper. And then, of course, they said, well, why do you care about this man? And they said, don't you know? I mean, this is the biggest murder in Minnesota history for the last 50 years. And so then they wrote the story that the family was mad about. So I, I sat just a second, and, and I said, you know, if, if your family's really mad at that St. Paul reporter for spilling the beans, he could get even with that guy if he gave me an interview, Roger talked to me, and not that guy. And his editors will be so mad at him. You know, this is a long shot, and I'm just you know, trying, to, trying to figure something out. And the brother said, well, let me check. So we left, and I actually didn't think I had a prayer. So I went back and I packed up, and I was getting ready to go to the airport, and the phone rang. And the voice said, Joe, this is Roger. I hear you're looking for me. And I said, oh, I'd love to talk to you. Would that be okay? And he said, sure. I'll meet you at a half hour, take your car, and I'll be at the railroad station, and we can talk a little bit. So I got all excited, and I drove there. And I thought it was going to be like the railroad station where there are trains and people and cars, and it was the abandoned rail station. <laughs> no one around. I'm in the middle of this parking lot. And I started to think, was this a good idea? And I'm starting to think maybe it wasn't. But then in the rearview mirror, I could see coming up behind me, and it was Roger. I could tell, but he gained a lot of weight, and he was walking really slow. And my first thought was, I can outrun him if I have to. <laughs> so he got in, and we talked a little bit, and he gave me a tour of Latrobe, Pennsylvania. It's the home of Rolling Rock Beer. Some people have heard of that. It's also where Arnold Palmer learned how to golf. His dad had worked at the golf course there, and that's where Arnie grew up. And it's the home of Fred Rogers, Mr. Rogers. And so we drove around, and we drove by Mr. Rogers' house and looked at the golf course. And so I got talked to Roger a little bit, but he wouldn't talk about the murders. My big question was, was Marjorie involved? And now she'd already been acquitted so that they couldn't take her back to court for double jeopardy, but I really wanted to know. And Roger just said, nah, I'm not going to talk about it. I'm not going to talk about it. And he wouldn't. But at least I got an interview with him and I talked with him. It wasn't a great story, but at least I had a story. So that, that was my first um, trip to La Trobe to meet Roger. A couple years later, I went back, four years later, and it was the 10th anniversary of the murders. And I wanted to go and interview everybody. And so I, I went out. And when I flew into the La Trobe airport, someone in the lobby yelled, hey, Joe. And I looked, and it was Roger. He'd somehow found out which flight I was on and called me over and he said, hey, I got an idea. He said, you can stay at my house. You don't have to rent a hotel. And I thought, no, I'm not going to do that. So I told him, I said, the paper already bought, paid for the hotel, so I'm going to stay there. He said, well, how about this? 
said, you don't have to rent a car, you can, you can use my car. And I thought, well, that way I'm guaranteed at least some time with him. You know, we'll have to drive around a little bit. So I said yes. And so we went out to the parking lot and there was this really old battered station wagon. And he said, my parents are letting me use their old car. And then he handed me the keys, said, why don't you drive? So I got in, started the car, and he tapped me on the shoulder and he said, you got to be really careful because the brakes are bad. Oh. Oh my God. And I thought, that's how he's going to get me. <laughs> Reporter killed in fiery crash, but it didn't happen. It worked out fine. This time, Roger was in really worse shape than the first time I'd seen him there. He was on welfare. He was buying clothes at the Salvation Army, and he'd started to drink again. In fact, he was living above a bar. Again, Roger would not tell me anything about Marjorie or anything more than he'd said in his confession. And that's when I figured out what the problem was. It turned out that Roger's lawyers had told him if he said anything more about the murders that wasn't in his confession, they would charge him with perjury for lying under oath about the confession. And his lawyers had warned him that they would do that. I actually talked to the prosecutor just about a year and a half ago, and he said, yes, we would have put him in jail for perjury if he had started talking about different things than he told us. So, so they were right. And then the other thing with Marjorie was he really suspected that Marjorie would somehow take care of him with some money or something if he'd keep his mouth shut. He always suspected that. Now, he shouldn't have thought that because Marjorie went once to visit him in prison and never again. But Roger always held up hope. It was about one year later, I was, I'd gotten home from a Twins game one night and the phone rang and it was the sister-in-law from Pennsylvania. She said, have you heard about Roger? I said, no. And she said, he just killed himself. And so for the third time, I went back to Latrobe and I went to the funeral and there were like five people. There was mom and his dad and brother and sister and another brother and me. It was very pathetic and he obviously had no friends and he died a, a, an awful death after committing some awful crimes. And so I stuck around a little bit in the trope just to try to talk to people again. And I found out, I was shocked to find out that Roger had left a suicide note. And in the suicide note, he'd said, I never harmed those gals, meaning Elizabeth and Velma in Duluth, comma, I've never hurt anyone in my life. And I thought, oh my gosh, I've been wrong all these years because on his deathbed, before he killed himself, he's coming clean. And I really thought that we had it wrong. Somehow, someone else had done it. And so I was really uh, struck to the core about this. But then, in the course of talking to a few other people, it turned out Roger actually had a girlfriend at the time he killed himself. One of the townspeople told me. And I said, well, really? She wasn't at the funeral. And he said, well, no, she wasn't at the funeral because she's in the hospital. Right before he killed himself, Roger beat her up so badly that he'd broken a collarbone and broken ribs and scarred up her face, and she was still hospitalized. And that's when I realized Roger was lying on the suicide note because he could hurt people when he was drinking. He'd been drinking that night he killed himself, and he'd been drinking the night of the murders. So I think Roger was just trying to convince himself and all of us that he wasn't involved but I believe that he was involved. So Roger's unti uh, untimely death, and he, he had a, a real bad, pathetic life. All right, so now we're going to go back, and uh, lots of you probably are real interested in it. Marjorie. Marjorie got off on the murders, and the next thing I heard about was one of my aunts in Roseville called me and said, Hey, Joe, Marjorie started going to our church. And I said, really? And she said, and you're not going to believe this. She just showed up today with a man, an older man, and was introducing him as her new husband, Wally. And I said, really? Boy, that's, I'm surprised. And so I did some checking. And I found out she had married Wally Hagen from out this side of town. And I found the, the, the wedding certificate. They got married in Williston, North Dakota. I had that. But then the question is, when did she divorce Roger? Oh. 
Now at this point, Roger is in Latrobe waiting for the new trial. So I asked Meshbesher, I said, well, when did Roger get divorced? And he said, I don't think they're divorced. And I said, oh, she got married. He said, I don't think they're divorced. So I looked everywhere at the courthouses, nothing about a divorce. So the only thing left to do was to call Roger, ask him, because Marjorie doesn't talk to me. I called the phone number that was Roger's. I knew it was his apartment. And remember, I talked to him during the trial, so I knew his voice. So I called and said, um, Joe Kimball, I'm calling uh, for, for Roger. And the voice very hesitantly said, uh, Roger isn't here right now. This is his um, brother. But I knew it was Roger. I, he just didn't want to talk to me. I said, OK, brother, here's the deal. Marjorie has remarried, and I want to know if, if Roger knows anything about a divorce. When did that happen? How, what's going on with that? And there was this long, sad pause. And the voice said, Roger doesn't know anything about a divorce. So I wrote a story the next day in the paper saying, Marjorie remarries, but no evidence of a divorce. And quote, a family member in Pennsylvania says, Roger doesn't know anything about this. So we ran the story. And they filed bigamy charges in North Dakota for Marjorie. Now, it's not the kind of thing they come and get you, but if she ever gets caught speeding going on 94, I'm hoping that they haul her in and, and, and go further with those bigamy charges. So that was the first thing. Then Wally and Marjorie, the third husband and her, bought this house out near here in Mound. She called it the Cranberry House, and they lived there. And um, one of the firemen who was involved in this knows lots more than me, so I'll make sure, try to make sure I get it right. But uh, my understanding is they could not afford it. They couldn't make the payments. And Marjorie was forced to sell it and move. And so they moved out, and Marjorie loved this house. I think it was the next night that suddenly that house burned down. And the officials, the fire marshal and everybody, were certain it was arson. And they did a lot of investigating and looked around. And they charged Marjorie with burning down the house. And finally, she was convicted. And she was sent to prison at Shakopee. It was like a two and a half year sentence. She served about two years of it. Now, Wally, who his wife, Helen, had died, as I understand it, just down the way here. She'd been in, a, in a assisted living. Wally stuck with Marjorie even when she went to prison for this. And he had an RV and he parked it near the prison and actually went and visited Marjorie almost all the time. Then when she got out, the two of them took the RV and headed southwest. They, they went to New Mexico and Colorado and finally ended up in a little town called Ajo, Arizona. It's A-J-O, and it's about 37 miles from the Mexican border. And she and Wally lived there, and it was tiny. It was one bedroom. I was, I was in it uh, about two years ago. The new owner didn't know anything about Marjorie. <laughs> I was very surprised to hear my stories. Soon after they moved in, police started getting reports of fires in the neighborhoods, garages and houses and things. And the first thought was it was probably kids maybe breaking into snowbird houses and leaving cigarettes lit, lit, lit or something. Uh, and so they were on the lookout for these hooligans until one night, the man who lived next door to Marjorie was a border patrol agent and he was getting ready to go to work on the night shift and he noticed something on his windowsill and it was a kerosene soaked rag. And he knew about these arsons and so he called the police and said, I think I'm next. And so they sent an officer to kind of see what was happening. And they waited inside. And after it got real dark, they heard what they, they thought they heard a flick of a match. And they rushed out and chased someone down the alley. And it was Marjorie. And they said, what are you doing here? And she said, oh, I was just walking my dog. And, she, and they said, what about that kerosene so rag? And she said, I saw that earlier. Uh, the dog found it. I thought it was my neighbor's t-shirt. I was just returning it to him. Oh. 
And they didn't believe this, and they actually arrested her and charged her with arson. Tempted arson on this one, but other arsons. Now, she couldn't come up with bail right away. So she was in jail for a couple weeks, waiting for her husband and the family to come up with bail money. When they first moved there, Wally was in a wheelchair, and Marjorie told the neighbors that I, she was going to Mexico to get those cancer drugs because Wally was so sick and had cancer. And so he seemed to be in pretty dire straits. Well, I called down to one of the other neighbors after I heard Marjorie had been arrested, and the woman said, you know, now that Marjorie's in jail, Wally's doing really well. <laughs> she said, you know, he's not in the wheelchair anymore. And in fact, Marjorie never let him have fast food, and he's going up to the Kentucky Fried Chicken almost every day. She said, I think he's flirting with the lady there. And I thought, wow, Marjorie must have been feeding him something to keep him docile in the wheelchair. And sure enough, after she made bail, I called back and they said, yeah, Wally's back in the wheelchair. And so he was, again, very sick. Now they went to trial, they had a trial, and they talked about the kerosene soap rag and all these other arsons. And Wally was called as a witness for Marjorie. And everyone was surprised when they wheeled him in on a gurney to testify at the front, laying flat on his back. He said, they said, he's so sick, he can't, uh, can't walk. And he said, my wife, Marjorie, has terrible arthritis. She couldn't even light a match. There's no way she'd try to start a fire. And he tried to testify towards her, her character. And then after he finished, the judge called a recess and the jurors went off to their room, which looked out on the parking lot. And then they watched out the window as the gurney got pulled over to a van. And then they saw Wally hopped right off and seemed to be way better than what he'd looked like there. And they thought something's goofy here. They're, they're not telling the truth. And so they, they didn't listen to Wally's testimony, and she was found guilty of the arsons. The judge sentenced her to 15 years because of the severity of in so many of them. And normally in Arizona, when you're arrested and you're charged and convicted, they come and take you right to prison right away. But Marjorie stood up to the judge and said, Judge, you saw how sick my husband Wally was. I need one day to take care of Wally before I go off to prison. And the judge said yes. But the police officers who had arrested her, they were really worried Marjorie was going to come out of that courthouse, turn left and keep going to Mexico and never come back. They were really worried. So they followed her back to Ajo. And in fact, at one point, they pulled alongside her on the highway. And you know, what is it they do? They, I, we, we see you. And they drove by her house several times an hour overnight to make sure she hadn't left. And the car was still there. The next morning, one of the officers went to work on a bicycle. He was riding his bike and he drove by and he thought he'd just kind of poke his head nearby. He smelled gas coming from this little house. He knocked on the door and said, Marjorie, what's going on? And she said, oh, you know those gas stoves. Sometimes they don't light, and I'm trying to air the house out now. But don't worry, everything's good, and I will turn myself in when I'm supposed to, in a couple hours. So the officer went back to the police station. Two hours later, the phone rang, and Wally was dead. So they rushed back to the little house, and they went in, and Wally was dead in the bed. And they found a hose, a garden hose, that had been cut to be the length of the stove into, around the corner into the bedroom. And they also found a pile of pills that it looked like either he'd taken them or she'd given him or something, but Wally was dead. So they arrested Marjorie and charged her again with murder, with the murder of Wally Hagen. And I was getting ready to go. I thought I'd get a good cover another trial, but I got a call after about a month from the police officer who had arrested her, and he was very, very angry and distraught, and he said, they dropped the murder charge. And I said, oh, why? And he said, well, first of all, she's going to prison for 15 years. They figured that's something. Second, it turned out that he actually had died from the pills. 
the, the cause of death was, was the pills, and they were his own prescription. And the third thing that I hadn't known, they'd left a suicide note, and it was a double suicide note. Marjorie had written at the top saying, I didn't do anything wrong, and I can't bear to go back to prison, so I'm going to take my life. And then Wally had scribbled, I can't live without her, so I'm going to also take my life. So we know what happened, sadly. Marjorie said, honey, you go first. <laughs> and she never did. I, I'm sure it never even meant to. So Wally, Wally died, and, and uh, Marjorie went off to do prison for the 15-year stretch, and she was in Phoenix. After about eight years of prison, Marjorie tried to get out early. She filed for early release. And so I thought, I'm going to go to that hearing. And so I went to the, the parole board. And it was just this little tiny room. And there's three guys who are going to hear the case and me. And then there were two other people in back. It turned out those were Wally's children from his first marriage who had come all the way to Phoenix to make sure Marjorie stayed in jail as long as possible. And so they led her in the court, uh, into the little hearing room. She had a bright orange jumpsuit, you know, very attractive. And I got a camera and I'm sitting there taking pictures of Marjorie and she's fuming. She's just so mad that I'm there. Then she sees the Hagen kids and she's really, really mad now. And when it's her time to speak, I am convinced if she had said, I learned my lesson, I'm not gonna burn down any houses, I think they'd have let her go early. But instead, being Marjorie, she got up and pointed to the Hagen kids and me and she said, everybody blames me for everything. I, they always say it's my fault and I, I don't know what they've got against me and why they're always on my case. And she went on this rant rather than taking responsibility and forgiveness. And so, of course, they said, no, you, you're not going to get out early. And so the, she did not get out. I went to the courthouse then after the hearing and found the file. And it turns out that her sister, Jennifer, the good sister, had written a letter to the court saying, we think it's in society's best interest if my sister stays in a little bit longer. And two of her children from the first marriage had also sent letters saying, we're OK if mom cools her heels a little longer. So they kept her in. She was released then, though, in uh, 2004. She's still alive. She was released in 2004 and continues to live in Tucson. Uh, just a couple things about that. I kept thinking, all right, what's next? It's Marjorie. Something's going to happen. And it took three years. But after three years, somebody called me from the, from the area and said, Marjorie had befriended an elderly man in an assisted living home and convinced him to give her power of attorney so that she could help him write his checks and pay his bills. And so she did that for a while. Then the guy died and Marjorie kept writing the checks. The bank figured it out. They say, wait a minute, this guy, he's, he's died and the checks are going into her account. So they called the police who rushed in because they know Marjorie. They've been through her, her thing. And when they got there, the main thing they wanted to know was how did this poor man die? And it turned out Marjorie had used that power of attorney to have him cremated before anybody knew what was going on. So we don't know how he died. And all they could charge her with was fraud and forgery. And she was found guilty of that. But no jail time, only probation. So Marjorie's on super, super big probation in Tucson. And, and she still is living there. Now, not long after that, she applied herself to live in a different assisted living community because she claims she can't see and is sick. And I, I actually don't believe it, but she claims that. This assisted living place said, no, <laughs> we don't want you living here. And Marjorie sued them and went to court, and they actually had to have a hearing. And I didn't go to it, but I can picture the judge going through the file and saying, no, 
they don't have to let you live here. And so she was refused access there. In the last two years, she has just bought a new townhouse. I keep track of her. And uh, so she's, she's just turned 86 last year. And her mother was 83. And the other sister, Jennifer, has died. And she was, I, I think, 82 when she died. So Marjorie's still going strong. I think she's going to outlast all of us. Um, just a... Uh, in interesting story about Marjorie. Um, my wife is, uh, she, write, she worked at WCCO for many years, and her name's Julie Kramer, and she wrote some mystery novels, Stalking Susan and things some people have read. And she goes around the country and, and does bo bookstore talks and things. We were going to do one in Tucson about four years ago. And she was talking to the bookstore owner in Tucson. And the, and the woman said, hey, Julie, you're from Minnesota. Have you ever heard of this Marjorie person? And Julie said, well, as a matter of fact, my husband has been chasing her for years. And so the woman asked if we would both come and do the book signing because she said, there's lots of people here who know Marjorie. And so I did go down there. It turned out she used to come to the bookstore and get murder mysteries all the time. Who can imagine? At the, at the signing, you know, most of the people were for Julie because she's famous, but, but there were like 10, 10 women uh, there for me. And they invited us out to eat afterwards. And they said, we got a great story for you. When Marjorie was released from prison, she moved in down there. And one of the first things she did was adopt a greyhound dog. After they're done racing, they, people adopt them so they don't kill them. And this group that, of Greyhound people were very excited to have a new member who would adopt a Greyhound. And so they gave Marjorie Blueberry, one of, the, one of the Greyhounds. Then Marjorie was arrested for the fraud and forgery for, for writing the checks. And the story was in the paper. And it mentioned that she had this criminal past. And they finally Googled her and said, oh my god, this is Marjorie. We can't let her have one of our dogs. So they, they, while she was in jail, they came and took the dog back and readopted it to California. And when she got out, she was furious and sued them, took them to court saying, they stole my dog. So they had to hire a lawyer and defend themselves. And they, they really hate her for all this. And so they, they're telling me the story. And she said, now she doesn't have a greyhound, but she got a new dog. It's like a Rottweiler or something. And they, she, said, she takes it every morning to an off-leash dog park and lets him run. And I said, where is that dog park? <laughs> so the next morning, Julie and I got up early. We went to the parking lot and waited and waited. And uh, Julie, when she was at CCO, she was... Um, on the I team, she did the I team. So she set me up with my camera, you know. So if we found her, then we'd get some pictures of her. And mic myself. And so we waited, and finally she came. She got out of the car. And the dog, it gets bigger every time I tell the story, but she comes out with <laughs> this big dog and takes it over to the park and goes in the gate. And I, oh, I said, oh my gosh. And I said, honey, tell the kids I love them. <laughs> I wasn't sure I was coming back. And I was getting ready to go. And then she came back out without the dog. She'd forgotten something. She went to the car. So I walked over to her and I said, Mrs. Hagen, I wrote about you for many years. I'm retired now from the newspaper, but I, I would love to talk to you more about your side of the story. Now. My wife had made me promise that if she invited me in, I wouldn't eat anything. So I didn't raise that issue of going for coffee. And she looked at me and she said, I know who you are. You've been stalking me for years. And actually, the last time I'd been there was like, you know, 10, 12 years that I'd actually seen her was at the parole hearing. And I said, well, I was just doing my job, but now I'd like to hear from you. And she said, get out of here now before I call the police. And it was a public place, so I, I wasn't going to be arrested. I had a right to be there. But it was pretty clear she wasn't going to talk to me. And so I just gave her my card and said, if you ever do want to tell your side of the story, um, 
you know, let me know and, and I'll come back. I haven't heard from her. A year ago, we were back in Tucson and Marjorie had moved to a new townhouse. This time I went and I knocked on her door and she stuck her out and said, get out of here now. <laughs> so she, again, she wouldn't talk to me, but she still is alive and, and living there. Um, one thing that we have to talk about, and I, I know I'm going very long here, but there's so many different aspects of this. One thing is, what about the money? And at the time of the murders, it appeared to us that Miss Congdon's estate, now the mansion was not part of it, that had been willed to the university, that was true. But it looked like each of the daughters probably stood to inherit about $8 million worth of stuff. And Jennifer got hers, but when Marjorie was charged with the murders, five of her kids from her first marriage filed a civil lawsuit that said, we think our mom was involved in killing our grandmother, so she shouldn't profit from this. And they filed the suit. Now, because there was a criminal case, we had to wait till the end of the criminal case before that even took any action. And then when Marjorie got off, we thought it was going to be just like O.J., where he was acquitted of the murders, but then had a civil case, and the father of the guy he killed got all his money and his trophies and everything, and it's a whole different ball game when you have a civil trial. So we thought there'd be a second trial about the money. But Meshbesher, as I mentioned, he's very, very smart. Um, he, he died last year, but um, he realized that this would be a problem, and so he made a deal with the kids and they settled out of court and the kids got a big chunk of the money up front from the, the inheritance but uh, another part of it was put in the bank and invested for Marjorie to live on for the rest of her life and we were never sure exactly how much that was but it turned out when I was down in Tucson I went to the courthouse and Marjorie sues lots of people and sometimes in those court cases you have to list your income and Marjorie had listed her income, and it looks like she gets about $50,000 a year from the mansion, from Elizabeth's inheritance. So she did profit from it in a way. An extremely sad part of that that I found in looking at her income, she also gets a small pension that was Wally's. From his, he was an electrician, and even though it's pretty clear she was involved in how he died, she's still getting apparently his pension. So. Now, after Marjorie just, Marjorie got out of jail in Arizona in 2004. Soon after she got out, I got a call from her lawyer down there who claimed, uh, he said, Marjorie is broke. Now she should have been getting all this money and he said, Marjorie's broke and she wants to write a book about the case and she wondered, Joe, if, if you would help her. And I said, well, his name was Ed. I said, Ed, many problems here. First of all, she's not gonna make any money on it. I, I make just enough to reprint my book every time Marjorie does something. So I, she's not gonna get rich. She's not gonna get rich. Second of all, unless she tells the truth, you know, either that I, I, uh, I killed my mother and I'm sorry, or I killed my mother and she deserved it, something that sounded true, no one would care. You know, just Marjorie saying, I didn't do it, I didn't do it. And then I said, the third problem is, no one should go to work with Marjorie, <laughs> and I'm not going to. <laughs> and I said, but if you, write a, if you guys write a book, I'll be happy to write a story about it for the paper, but I'm not getting involved. Well, about two years after that, some, one of the reporters in Tucson called and said, Marjorie was accusing this lawyer that I just talked to of, of stealing her money. And I said, no, I, I don't believe that because if anyone's bilking people, Marjorie is doing it. And I said, no, I, did, I, I wouldn't believe that if I were you. Well, it turned out I was wrong. The lawyer had embezzled all of her money while she was in prison and he's now in prison. So Marjorie lost all of that money she should have been getting during those prison years. Yeah, he got it. But now she's back on track and getting, you know, she gets about 4,000 something a month. So now she does have money. But that was amazing to me that uh, you know, Marjorie lost all her money on that. So. All right, I think we gotta go.